morning, happy Sunday, and welcome to Engage Church Duluth. If this is your first time joining us, I want to just extend a special welcome to you. And uh, if you've been tuning in with us for the past several months here online, welcome back. It's just so awesome to every week have the chance to connect together and, and see new names and familiar names pop up. And we're just so grateful that we have the ability to still spend time together, together as a church. Um, if, this is your first time at Engage or Church Period. Uh, first of all, we want you to feel comfortable and, and know that however you want to participate or, or listen is, is totally awesome. But the way that we do things is we start with a time of worship and singing, and then we go into a time of teaching. So today we have another big crew. We've got Styx and Kaya and Tamina and myself, Tom, here to uh, rock out and praise our awesome God today. So we're going to sing a couple of songs together. I invite you to join us as we do this.
Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up this time to you. I, I know that you have brought people here today, wherever they're at for a reason. And I just ask that, that we can press pause on where we're at in our lives right now, good or bad, and just be, be present in church today and be present with the words that we're about to hear in this message. I just, I pray for strength. I pray for patience and peace and the energy to just continue to pursue you and to try to love in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Hello and welcome to Engage Church Online. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're catching us on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Super uh, glad to have you here, excited that you're going to be a part of what's going on today. We're continuing our series we've been in called Reclaim, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. I just want to give you a few announcements of things going on, but first, you know, if this is kind of maybe your first time or you've checked us out a few times, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. And to do so, it's very simple. We've set it up for you. All you have to do is text the word CONNECT to 218-220-6191 and a member of our team will get in touch with you, share a little bit about what Engage is about and try to get to know you as well and connect you with some awesome people here at Engage. So feel free to text again the word CONNECT to 218-220-6191. Something really cool that's happening this afternoon. It's a great, I would call it a great opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. Okay, I'm assuming you said it, good job. A great opportunity we have is we're going to be doing our second prayer walk this afternoon through the Lincoln Park neighborhood. That is one of the vision points of our church. We wanna love Lincoln Park. It's a neighborhood we're a part of. Our church meets at the Clyde Ironworks when we're in person. We're in this neighborhood, we wanna love it. And so we're just gonna walk the neighborhood. We're gonna be praying as we walk by houses. And what's really cool is we have these super awesome door hangers that Cindy Rodness made for us. And I just wanna read what it says to you so you get a feel for what we're trying to accomplish here. It says, Hey, we prayed for you today. We love this neighborhood and want to be a source of encouragement to you. We would be honored to continue praying for you. If you have a specific need or request, please visit our website or send us a quick text message. Then it has a number and our web address on it. So it's a way for us to connect with our neighborhood, to meet them where they're at, to pray for them, and ask God to open up doors so that we can meet needs um, spiritually and physically. So I'm really excited. I hope that you will be able to join us. We're going to be meeting at 1 p.m. this afternoon in the side parking lot of the Clyde Ironworks, which is right across the street from Stewart's Bike and Sports Shop. And we'll be kind of giving out directions there, passing out materials, and then we'll be kind of dividing and conquering as we go out and pray for the neighborhood. So I hope you can make it. Another really cool thing that we have coming up really quick, mark your calendars. August 21st, that's a Friday night, we are going to be getting together for a beach bonfire. We felt it's about time we got together and did something fun, and we think that this could be really exciting, especially as the weather is cooking up and heating up, and it used to be really fun to be by the water, have a fire, maybe some guitar music, hint, hint, Tom. And you know, it'd be really fun just to do that and just to connect after such a time away from each other. And of course, we'll be practicing social distancing and masks and all of those things, but it's just a great opportunity. So mark your calendars. That's Friday, August 21st, time to be determined as well as location, but just keep that date, save the date, if you will. The last thing I just want to say is thank you so much for continuing to support Engaged Church through your prayers, through your words, letters of encouragement, um, nice uplifting notes, and also financially. We very much appreciate your faithful giving and just um, even through this difficult time that we still are going through, it does not go unnoticed and we just feel very blessed and thankful um, for that. So if you would like to continue to give or if you want to contribute to Engage, don't feel pressured. It's not an obligation, but if that's something that you feel led to do, you can do so in one of three ways. You can download our Church Center app or you can visit our website or you can just send in a plain old check to the address that you see on your screen. Again, thank you so much for continuing to support us financially, but also with your prayers, with words of encouragement. They mean a lot to us, 
as we navigate things these days. So thank you again. I just want to pray for us. Pray for our offering time, our donation tithes, offerings, whatever word you want to use. And then we're going to jump in to the message today. So Heavenly Father, I just pray that you be with us today. Give me the words I need to say that you want me to communicate to my friends here. And I just pray that you would um, continue to meet our needs uh, in their entirety. That you would uh, bless us as we're faithful to you and doing what you've called us to do. And um, that we would just continue to strive to be more and more the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So for the last couple weeks, we've been in a series called re claim. And it's a series where we're studying the book of Ezra. And maybe if you haven't heard of that book, Ezra is a book from the Old Testament, which is the first half of your Bible. And it's a short book, about 10 chapters long, and we've covered about six chapters. And I know that sometimes people kind of come and go and they hear one message and don't hear the next one. I don't want you to feel lost. So what I'm doing is I'm going to challenge myself, and I am not known for uh, my brevity being brief when I speak, but I'm going to challenge myself to give you a recap in one minute or less of six chapters. Do you think I can do it in the comment section? Let me know. Let me hear it. I think I can do it. I'm going to give it a shot. Here we go on the clock. Chapters one through six, book of Ezra in one minute or less. The book of Ezra is a story about God's people, the Israelites. They didn't always listen to God and thus he had to punish them to get their attention. In this case, he allowed the nation of Babylon to come in, conquer them, destroy their temple, and lead them off into captivity for 70 long years. After 70 years, a dude named Cyrus comes on the scene, who's also the king of Persia, which by the way, Persia conquered Babylon, which was the nation that conquered the Israelites. And he says, hey Israelites, it's time for you to return home and rebuild your God's temple. So a few of them make the long journey home, they lay the foundation, and they complete it, and there was much celebration. However, when they went to start building the actual temple on that foundation, there was opposition. The surrounding nations didn't want them to build the temple, and they actually were successful in stopping the building of the temple for 15 years. Again, long wait. After that, though, a new king comes on the scene, gives them permission, thumbs up, and they continue the work, they finish the temple. That is the end of Ezra, chapter 6. So there you have it, a one-minute summary of the first six chapters of the book of Ezra. I hope it was helpful. But maybe you're thinking, hey, good stuff, but who is Ezra already? I mean, we're six chapters in out of ten, and I still don't know why the book is titled Ezra. Well, I'm glad you're thinking that if that's the case, because in chapter 7, we finally meet this elusive Ezra figure. Verse 1, it says this. Many years later, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named, you guessed it, Ezra. And what I want us to focus on in that first verse is that many years later, those first three words, what you need to understand is, it was actually 60 years, 6-0. Six 60 years has gone by since the end of chapter 6 and the start of chapter 7. That is a long time. And I got to imagine that Ezra, who was in Persia still, he was still in captivity and exile, it was probably very difficult for him to be stuck there knowing all the amazing things that God was doing back home in Jerusalem rebuilding the temple, the nation of Israel, the Israelites turning back to God, all this amazing stuff happening, and Ezra's still stuck in captivity. An incredibly difficult thing to do, to have to sit and wait. And I think you and I relate to this because we live in an instant society. I want the fastest internet. I want my food as fast as I can get it. I was actually in the McDonald's drive-thru today and I reversed and left without ordering because it took too long to be able to place my order. We just want things fast. I want to have a boyfriend or girlfriend now. I want a job promotion now. I want to be married now. I want to have kids now. I want, I want. We're really great at asking and wanting and demanding things now and fast. But what we're not really great at is waiting. Because here's the deal, and here's what we're going to learn from Ezra. What you do while waiting matters. What you do while you're waiting matters. It's not lost 
time. My wife and I, we like uh, CrossFit. If you're not familiar with CrossFit, you know, you lift, lift a bunch of weights, you do a bunch of crazy exercises, and you get in shape. We like it. Um, we probably like watching uh, the top athletes compete more than actually exercising ourselves. Some room for personal growth there, at least for me. But we love watching it, and we actually got a chance to go to the CrossFit Games in Madison, Wisconsin, a few years ago, which featured the top 40 male and female CrossFit athletes from the whole world. I mean, incredible athletes. And one of the athletes we got to watch was named Cole Sager. Here's a picture of him. And one of the things I really like about Cole Sager as an athlete is his mentality. At his garage gym at home, where he does most of his training, on the wall he has a quote. It's from Abraham Lincoln, and it says this. I will prepare, and someday my chance will come. And what I get from that is that mentality is when I'm not competing, when I'm not on the competition floor, when I'm not under the brightest lights, that's actually the most important time. When I'm training up to four to five to six times a day, when I'm watching my diet so carefully so that I can perform at my highest level, that's what matters the most. Those times, the waiting, the training times, not the competition time, but the times when no one's watching, the times when I'm preparing so that I can compete at the highest level. That's what matters because, again, the idea I'm trying to communicate this morning is what you do while waiting, when you feel like things are at a standstill, when things aren't quite where you want them to be, when your life goals and trajectory isn't quite lining up while you're waiting, that is the most important time. That matters. What you do while waiting matters. And Ezra understood this based on what verse 6 says. This Ezra was a scribe who was well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to the people of Israel. And what we got to understand first is this verse, verse 6, says that Ezra was a scribe. And what's a scribe? I mean, to us, that might sound like a, a fancy office assistant taking some messages, writing down a few notes, but it actually goes much deeper than that. Because in the Jewish culture, a scribe was highly respected, highly esteemed. They were intelligent, and they had spent a lot, a lot of time studying God's word. That's what the law of Moses is referring to. That was kind of their Bible back then the law of Moses, they studied it inside and out, memorized it, they understood it, they applied it, and they could teach it to others. So as I think about Ezra and that period of 60 years where it must have been hard for him to sit around and wait, knowing such great stuff was happening back home, and yet he used that time wisely. He studied, he prepared, so that when his chance comes, he would be ready. And I got to think for us, how are we preparing today? How are we preparing spiritually so that when an opportunity arises for us to, to grow and share our faith, we'll be ready? How are we preparing today? Are we studying? Are we reading? Are we praying? Are we following Ezra's example that what you do while waiting matters? Good stuff to think about. The story continues now in verse 13, and this is actually King Artaxerxes, the ruler of Persia, the nation that is ruling over the Israelites, and he's writing a letter to Ezra himself. Ezra, getting a letter from the king, this is what it said, I decree that any of the people of Israel in my kingdom, including the priests and the Levites, may volunteer to return to Jerusalem with you. What an amazing feeling that must have been. For Ezra, after all that waiting, all those years of seeing all the cool stuff going on back home in Jerusalem, hearing all the great reports of the things that God was up to, and yet he had to wait and stay in Persia. But remember, what he did while waiting mattered. He studied, he prepared, he applied God's word to his life, he taught others, and as a result, an opportunity came his way via the most powerful person in Persia, giving him the opportunity to return to his homeland with other people, to lead people, that is. And furthermore, he equipped him too. It wasn't just like, hey, go on this journey, good luck. 
in verse 15, it says, the king says, hey, take all this money too. I want to give you all the money you need. And you know what? The people from the surrounding nations too, they're going to pony up as well and give you money as well so that you'll have everything you need. Furthermore, Ezra, I give you all the authority that you'll need. That's verse 21. And lastly, in verse 25, what the king says is amazing. It says, Ezra, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and teach the people there how to live the life that God wants them to live. There's no way Ezra would have been able to do that had it not been for all those years of preparing for this moment. He had no idea this moment was coming but he prepared. Similarly, you and I, we have no idea what God wants to do through us in the lives of others in our world. We, we can't even begin to imagine the plans God might have for us. But what we can do while we wait, we can prepare. We can read the Bible. We can study it. We can try to understand it more and apply it. We can memorize uh, scripture, memorize Bible verses, internalize it, let it become a part of who we are. Well, we wait for those plans to unfold, but we wait for an opportunity, just like Ezra was given an opportunity. It wasn't all easy for him, though, because just because the king says, whoever wants to volunteer can go, not everyone volunteered, specifically a very important group of individuals known as the Levites. We pick this part of the story up in chapter 8, verse 15, where it says this, I went over the lists of the people and the priests who had arrived. So Ezra's reviewing the lists of the people who are volunteering to go on this journey with them. And as he's reviewing the lists, it says, I found that not one Levite had volunteered to come along. Not one Levite volunteered to make the journey. And what you need to understand is the Levites, and if you don't know, that's okay. This is why we study. This is why we learn so we can understand better what's going on. The Levites had a very special role in the Bible, in, in, in God's plan. They were given a special role where they would help the priests with all the functions of the temple. You know, with help with the sacrifices, help with the upkeep of the temple. That was their job. That was their purpose. And yet for 60 years, the temple has sat completed and the Levites have not returned. And furthermore, they didn't want to volunteer to go on this journey and return and fulfill their purpose. Now what you need to understand to sum it up and to be brief, eventually Ezra convinces them to go and Levites do return and make the trip with them. But I think it's so interesting because what purpose has God given you and God given me? And are we just kind of sitting around and not really wanting to live out that purpose as much as we could? Are we just kind of waiting, biding our time, or are we being intentional and going out? Are we studying the Bible? Are we learning it? Are we applying it? Are we loving people like God wants us to love them? Are we meeting needs? Are we living the life that God wants us to live? Are we living out that purpose? Or are we like those Levites who it's been 60 years and they're still not doing what they're supposed to be doing? It reminds me of a verse from the book of 1 Peter, which is from the New Testament, kind of that second half of the Bible. It's near the end of the Bible. And it's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. My wife and I have an on and off again discussion about real estate specifically our home and things we'd like to do to it, to update it, make some upgrades, maybe even get it ready to sell sometimes. And I gotta be honest, as many of you know, I'm not a handyman. And it's intimidating to me sometimes, all the projects that can stack up. I have a lot of ambition, not a lot of know-how. But yet there's some things that I can do. I might not be able to replace my windows by myself. I might need help and that's okay. We are a community working together. We need each other. But yet there are some things I'm capable of doing. I might not be able to put those windows in, but I can paint the trim on my garage. I can get that done. I have that within my skill set, my ability, my giftings, if you will. Although I don't know if I'd go that far to call my paint skills giftings. But the point is, is that there are some things I can do. I might not be able to do everything, but what can I do right now? How can I help right now? 
that verse from verse Peter saying, each one of you should use whatever gifts you have, whatever skills, whatever talent, whatever ability to serve others now. Not wait, not waste time, not wonder, well, I guess there's nothing much going on right now, God. You know, let me know when you need me. What can you do right now? And furthermore, how can you continue to grow so that you can do even more? As we wrap up today, I want to read you verse 10 from chapter 7, because some of, some of uh, my thoughts as I studied this, I thought, how could Ezra pull this off? How could he lead this huge group of people? How could the king just give him everything he needed to accomplish this? How did Ezra have the confidence to even do this? It's a big order, big opportunity, but a big task, intimidating. And this is probably the verse of, you know, the whole book, I would say, that I want to pattern my life after and that I hope you want to look at and say, I want to live like that too. Here's what verse 10 says of chapter 7. Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. How did all this happen? How did this opportunity come to be? How did the king of Persia, of all people, give Ezra the authority and the opportunity and everything he would need, all the money and resources, to make this happen? How did all of this line up after all the time of waiting, after 60 years of seeming futility? How did this all come to be? Three words. Ezra had determined. He made a decision. He says, this is what my life is about. Even though I really want to be in Jerusalem and there's cool things happening, no matter what, even while I'm waiting and it kind of stinks sometimes to wait, but no matter what, even so, I am going to determine to follow God the best that I can. I'm going to study. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. And I'm going to take that, apply it to my life, and teach others as well. So that when my time comes, I will be ready. And his time came. God opened that door. And I believe for each one of us, God wants to open doors for us, opportunities to do big, great things for him with the gifts and the abilities that he's given us. But the question is, will we be ready? Will we have determined, like Ezra, to give all that we can to God? to focus so much on the things of God that when times and opportunities present themselves, we will be ready. Ezra had determined. What have you determined for your life? What you do while waiting matters. What you determine the purpose of your life will be matters. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak and teach from the book of Ezra and, and just the lessons that are sometimes not super clear, but as we study and we dig deep, we find the wisdom and we find direction for our lives that you've given us. God, I pray that just like Ezra determined to focus on you and to give everything he had to you, even while he was waiting for opportunity, that we would do the same, God, that we would uh, deepen our relationship with you, that we commit ourselves to studying more, to reading the Bible more, to praying more, to thinking about others before ourselves more as we wait for opportunities for you, from you. I thank you for this time we've shared. I just pray that we would take time this week to consider what are we doing in the times of waiting, what have we determined the purpose of our life will be? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Next week, don't miss out. We're going to be wrapping up with the last message of our Reclaim series. I hope to see you this afternoon at 1 o'clock for our prayer walk. Remember, we're meeting in the parking lot, side lot of the Clyde Ironworks, 1 p.m. That's the parking lot right across the street from Stewart's Bike and Sports. Have a great rest of your day.